Hi again, everyone. Hello, hello. Um, my name's Holly, and I hope this is live. Yes, I think so. Um, my name's Holly, and I'm the founder of Indigo Volunteers, and it's Thursday, and it's six o'clock, and we are doing uh, Let's Talk Grassroots again, and we've had two phenomenal guests, and there is no exception to the rule with this week's guest, Hassan. Cannot wait for him to join and uh, for you to all hear from him and hear him speak. He's one of the most phenomenal speakers. Um, so um, why are we doing this? Why are we doing Let's Talk Grassroots? Just a reminder for those that haven't uh, joined, uh, listened before. We um, are doing this because we feel like there is a, a, a disconnect between what's going on in and around the humanitarian sector, in the field, out of the field, but in the grassroots movement. And we really want people that are working uh, in that area to be able to um, just reach out to people um, and for them to ask questions. We've got such a wonderful network. So um, we've been interviewing so Josie from Help Refugees last week and Jacob from Action for Education, the founder before. And as I said, this evening we've got Hassam. Um, so I think that's it. Before we start, before I, um, I let him join, it's just a reminder to everyone that we um, have opened applications uh, for um, health professionals, for volunteers. So if you um, are or know anyone who is a health professional, then definitely please do uh, get in touch with us because um, we have reopened applications for that. Um, that's a short announcement. Okay, so I'm just going to accept. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yes, Hassan. Hey. <laughs> oh, hi, how are you? Hi, good, thanks. How are you? I, I'm so good. I have to say from the very beginning, this is so surreal for me because this is part of the introduction. I, I, I don't mean to embarrass you, but you inspired me so much when I watched Exodus. So if, for those that haven't seen Exodus, um, it's a BAFTA award-winning um, documentary. And that was in, it was in 2016, wasn't it? Because that's when- 2016, I'm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. in Greece. And, and it was, it's a three part documentary. It had a second series after it. And you, you were on it. You were one of the main um, people on it being interviewed. And it's just one of the most phenomenal documentaries I've ever seen. And it really left me speechless and in shock of everything that's going on. I've been back and forth from Greece, but not seen the journey, if that makes sense, from, yeah. um, from your perspective, I suppose, and from your eyes, because uh, you were filming it, right? And and so to now, now to interview you is such an honor. <laughs> so lovely. Thank and you, the honor is mine. <laughs> so my first question is, what inspired you to, to film your journey from Syria to Greece and beyond? Um, how, how come you decided to pick up a camera and, and do that? Right, okay, so I have picked up a camera years before that, before that, uh, before smartphones were introduced, uh, I, my dad gifted me a, a, an analog camera, um, where I used to take pictures and he would, um, uh, sew out the films. And then I, uh, bought a semi-professional camera to, to take pictures. The old city of Damascus is one of the most beautiful places you'll ever see. Uh, I mean, I'm a bit biased because I am from the old city of Damascus, but it's literally like, it's I picturesque, have. it's great, yeah. like n narrow al um, uh, alleys with like very beautiful homes and shops and cafes. So that's where I started my journey with photography. And then the uprising started in 2011. And um, naturally, I picked up a camera as well to, to, to document uh, uh, mm. uh, the protests film the protests and uh, to, um, I was one of the thousands of citizens journalists who uh, basically um, uh, were on the front line in Syria to, to document the uprising. That mm -hmm. led to troubles. Um, I uh, went through a lot of troubles because of that, because of that, because Syria right now is um, the worst country for journalists. It's the deadliest, it's on the top of the list of the deadliest uh, country for journalists and citizen journalists. So naturally, when I left Syria, um, I didn't want to come to Europe, no offense, but I'm not a fan of Europe um, because of the weather, because of, because, because of, I like, I'm going to ask why, I understand, that's a reasonable thing. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> there's the misconception that everyone in the Middle East want to come, wants to come to Europe or wants to go to America, and that's not true, like, the Middle mm -hmm. East is actually great, and, um, 
uh, if we didn't have these totalitarian governments and regimes, we would have stayed. So I did stay in the region. I stayed in the Middle East and um, mm -hmm. lived in Lebanon, in the UAE. Um, I see some of my students in Dubai are joining the chat, so I'm gonna say hi to them <laughs> in, in, in Egypt. And then it got really difficult in terms of uh, sorting out documents. So I decided to do the journey and decided to film it because because um, it's the um, um, it's the worst humanitarian crisis in the Second World War, and I have access. It's in terms of filming. You uh, you look at access. If you have access, then you can make a good film. And I have yeah. access because I am doing that journey, and I wanted to document it because uh, because it's it's because I wanted to tell the story. I wanted I wanted to put a face on the crisis. Mm -hmm. So I did it and um, did a, an eighty seven trek through Europe all the way to Calais where I met the filmmakers who were making Exodus and we collaborated and we made the documentary. And it's, 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 uh, forget about the awards. I mean, people always say it's a BAFTA, Emmy winning, whatever. It's, it's not, it's not about the awards. It's the fact that it actually inspired a lot of people to take action yeah. and inspired it, it. And that's, that's to me, I, every work that I'm involved in now is a work that will channel things into action. So that's the long yeah. story. Sorry. That, that, no, I, that was so interesting to hear because I've only heard the short version before. Um, I am definitely one of those people that was inspired by that documentary. And after I watched that, I'm not joking, that was the turning point for me where I decided that this is now my 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 career path or my path. I don't, I don't want to say path and sound all you know, spiritual necessarily, but it was definitely the, the turning road for me. And um, I, I just watched it. And as I said, I'd been back and forth um, on a couple of different trips. Like I think I'd done three or four trips to Greece at that point, but only for maybe two, three, four weeks. And that I just, I'm moving. I am moving to Greece and, and basing myself there. And um, I've been there for like three and a half years now. So yeah, that is that. <laughs> and that's what I'm talking about. And, and I, I know people that watch that documentary and, and people don't just go, oh, that's a great documentary. People go, you know, that. It's what do we really do now? Has a <laughs> it has a profound impact, and, yeah. and actually, we say to people to to watch it before they, um, the volunteers before they come out, and if anyone says what reading or watching, we always say that. Um, someone's actually asking: Is the documentary available somewhere now? It's on Vimeo. You can you can um, either watch it on BBC iPlayer, but where you have, you're gonna have to pay money for this. So, but you can get it for free on Vimeo. Um, and just type in Exodus Argentina to Europe, and you'll get three episodes. And I just picking up, yeah, picking up on your point, um, um, I, so when I, we made that series and then I went back um, to make the second series um, because BBC and uh, B, uh, BBC commissioned a second series. So I, I, I went back to do that. And uh, I met so many people in camps in Greece and in Calais and uh, in Macedonia who like recognized me and said, uh, the reason why I'm here because I've I've seen the film and it inspired me to do to do something. So that's to me that was like the best thing that I got of the film is that it's actually inspired people to take action and to, to go out and volunteer. I mean, how does that how does it make you feel? That must be really surreal for you because I suppose you never realized that when you were filming, oh, this is going to be an award winning documentary. You were just filming. <laughs> Right? Was it for yourself? Uh, were you were you nervous about sharing it? Like how how was that process for you? Okay, it's quite surreal because I, I I was filming not knowing what I'm what I'm going to do with the footage, uh, but I knew that I was going to use I'm going to make something out of it. But what the most surreal moment is actually the the boat crossing which I filmed got shortlisted for the best moment on telly in in Britain in 2017. Um, it's 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 and that was mad by itself because I did not fathom that when I was doing that crossing and filming and our like that one like a year later it's gonna get shortlisted for the best moment on telly and it's here's the thing in terms of filmmaking and in terms of storytelling um, the mood has shifted now from the your average film crew going out there to get a story to uh, what 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 they call UGC user generated footage. And it's basically, it's you holding your smartphone and like filming around as if you're doing a story on Instagram. And yeah. that's more, that's more intimate. That's, that's more, it's more, re it's, it's more real. And that's it's basically, real. 
yeah, yeah. That's, that's why that's why Exodus got that recognition and, and won that those awards because of because because it's intimate basically it, people felt like they were walking in our footsteps yeah and I think Exodus was one of if not the first to, that I saw doing that you're right there was lots of journalists reporting before and this yeah. really was from from a completely different perspective but yeah it's it's now the norm like I, I, a journalist contacted me last week saying can you connect me with someone in the camp who can film the the how is how is it living in the camp a crowded camp in Samos uh, during coronavirus uh, and obviously not being able to follow any of the of the government uh, protocols was it was it Joshua who contacted you no no it was someone else from <laughs> okay and she she was she just wanted the perspective and and you're right you can't first of all you can't get journalists into the um the actual center of the not the jungle outside area but not into the center and um so that's one thing there's no access there. And then secondly, you're actually seeing it, it's, it's not being posed or fake set up for, for the cameras, you know? So I, it's, it's such a, a, a great way to see what's going on in the camps. Yeah, um, yeah. Can I just then, say hi quickly? Can I quickly say hi to, to, to Zainab and to uh, Leah? Because they're both like, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> so <laughs> hi to them. All the girls love Tommy to say hi to you. They were like, oh, you can speak to Hassan. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they love this before they sent me a message. Um, so then um, so you, you, you get to London. And how, when you said you didn't want to come to Europe in the first place, but you got to London, which is notoriously one of the hardest places to get to from my understanding um and experience how how why did you choose london or why did you continue your journey to london well london because naturally london is is where um london because it's the capital and i wanted to be in london because i um i'm i wanted I hit rock bottom, basically. I lived in Syria, then left, and then lived in Dubai, and then left, and lived in Lebanon, and then left. So I wanted, um, with all the respect to every city in the UK, but I wanted to be somewhere where it's 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 comfortable for me to kickstart my life and my career. And uh, it's, I mean, as you said, it's notorious because the, the home office cannot provide you uh, accommodation in, in London, um, and you are living off five pounds a day. Um, and so I had to rely on people's generosity. I basically there's an amazing charity called Refugees at Home. And um, uh, it was, it, I lived with uh, Cassie in Hitchin first, and then Rachel, who lives in Brixton and gave me a spare room to live in. And a lot of my mates actually relied on on that charity to, to, to just get somewhere to live until they can get their documents and then they can start working and officially making money again. Mm -hmm. So may, mainly London, because again, because it's, it's because it's accessible because of um because um, you can you can find work <laughs> yeah and um i think that i met that charity last year and they're, they're just phenomenal so again we can put a link um if anyone has a spare room or um is interested in looking for more information you can host people like hassan and help them out when they're in a <laughs> that um so you got to london and then fast forward a bit you've now had this huge flurry of um um, uh, uh, press and and media coverage because you posted a, a photo of you and your <laughs> role. Do you want to share what your role you're doing at the moment and what happened with that? Yeah, so April 1st, um, I started working at Whips Cross Hospital, which is tech, like literally a 10 minute walk from my flat here in Leytonstone in East London. And I've decided to do that because um, I, I did a simple Google search and I found out that they're looking for cleaners. And um, obviously there's risk involved because hospitals are hotspots for the virus. So I, I was a bit hesitant, especially because I, sorry, because I live with my fiance, Farah, and um, I, don't, I didn't want to go to the hospital and contract the virus and bring it home. So I assessed it and I, I sussed it out and I said, I mean, it's doable, I can do it. So I, I did it, I started, and it's, it's, I have to say, it's one of the toughest jobs I've ever done in my life. Like I've done, I've done some really tough jobs. I mean, I, I was a teacher for seven years. Teaching is one hell of a job. Like it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> my, my students drove me mad, but this is, this is, this is on a whole new level. So um, I did it because I read two articles. One of them is that this, the virus can survive on some surfaces for two weeks. And they mm -hmm. found out about this from cruise, a cruise ship, which was somewhere in, in Asia, um, that they, the, the, the crew got back um, and they discovered that the virus was there. 
and also the news of the NHS staff getting infected. And um, um, I then ad started adding, like connecting the dots and found out that like, it's cleaning is actually very important and because patients can 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 recover in a clean environment and the nhs staff can 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 operate in a clean environment so that's mainly why i did it and uh, i have to say like i in a very weird way honestly like I don't, it's quite strange but i'm like quite happy about doing this job like it's it plays such a in a like I, I do see people dying sometimes and mm -hmm. I do see my staff, my, my colleagues going through difficult times. But um, the reason why I say I'm happy because I feel like I am playing a very small role in this, in this, in, 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 the, in, in this movement, which is trying to protect everyone during this time. And mm -hmm. um, it's, I posted that picture. I was hesitant. I didn't want to post the picture because I didn't want to be like, oh, me, 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 like attention seeker, like crap. Um, so, so I, but I didn't, I, I was, I was genuinely hesitant. I like, I, I, I posted that picture a week after I started, but then it, 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 I, it, 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 I posted it and went viral and I was, I was trending on Twitter and like every, every continent has now covered it. Like I have a Japanese broadcaster interviewing me in, next week. So it's the reason why it got this coverage is it's not because of me, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm your average guy. Like I, I'm, I'm not like I, I, like I fuck up. Sorry, I'm, I'm not going to swear, but I like I, <laughs> I, I, I yeah. channel, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I actually fuck up. Like I do, I have mistakes, and I. But the, uh, the reason why I got coverage is because there's something about a Syrian um, refugee slash migrant in London working as a cleaner during the pandemic, and I think this sends a message about. Because Europe and the UK, especially in the past two years, it hasn't been kind to migrants and refugees. Like uh, it's it's the rhetoric is, is is insane. Like we've shut our borders and militarized our like our borders and sending boats back, and it's been quite mm. it's, it's been horrid. To, to so this, I think that sent a message about about basically when you open like when you actually open up and um, mm -hmm. give people uh, refuge they 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 do like they get involved back. They back. They're just, yeah exactly they have skills and and as that's actually going to be my next um question to you was you were um interviewed or well, you've been interviewed by quite a few people but notoriously <laughs> here's morgan when when i saw this interview i was like what? here's morgan um and he was actually very very complimentary about you um so was Susanna Reid and um they were just saying what a fantastic job you're doing and how much the respect they had for you was again that must be very strange and 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 linking with that how how do you feel about the 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 shift in narrative that's happening because from my experience it's been you know refugees and migrants they're a burden and they're take 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 and all this absolutely ridiculous um headlines that you see and now finally there's been a shift and that must be really, really pleasant. And obviously you're hugely contributing towards that. Um, such an interesting point. And you know what? I always say it's sad that it's taken us a pandemic to, to, to realize the importance of migration and the, import, and the value that migrants and refugees can bring to their host communities. It's sad that it has to be COVID-19 to, to, to make us realize this. Because right. um, um, no, no country in the West um, anywhere actually can operate without its migrants. If migrants and refugees decide to take a day off, this literally, like, they, 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 they will be <laughs> shut down. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so but, but what I used, um, Holly, is that what, what, what I try to do now, I saw that I now have a platform, I saw that I've been getting interviews, I saw that, I was like, let me then reflect on the bigger picture. And I started reflecting on my ward. So the ward I work in called Birch Ward, and it's a, it's an aerosol generating uh, aerosol generating ward in, in in medical terms it's 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 quite it's high risk it's very high risk you cannot walk in if you're not wearing full ppe and in my ward there are people from literally over 10 countries um including ghana nigeria and the caribbean and um uh, syria and palestine um the philippines india 
uh, Poland, and our our ward manager is an incredible woman uh, called Sister Pinar, and she's from Spain. So mm -hmm. we're all it's like a it's like a we're all working together, coming from different countries in a, in a hospital ward in London, and that's the message I'm trying to say. Like it's with without us, what <laughs> you know, like it, this, yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying that Brits like white British people are not working. Obviously, they are also working, but uh. It's it, we're, we're working together, you know. All in it, it, it's a big team that's like interwoven, and if you take out half of it, it's it's going to unravel, and it's all that's how I kind of see it. Um, can I? Yeah. That, can I say what's, Can I please. tell you actually another thing? Um, yes, please. Also, in terms of in terms of hospitals in general, and like healthcare and the NHS. You have to look at it as a pyramid because on the top of the pyramid you've got the consultants and the doctors and then you go down like to the nurses and the, the nursing assistants and then to the to the sisters and then the top of the the bottom of the pyramid you've got the ward hosts the the porters and the cleaners yeah. and here's the thing when i um when i don't have my cleaning kits around me people actually say good morning to me and be like hey hello sir mistaken me for a doctor because I'm white passing. And if I have my cleaning kit around me, literally, they walk past me as if I don't exist. Mm. And, and that is incredibly like, honestly, like, it's just it's just so yeah. wrong. Because yeah. if you if you look if you look at the human body, the clean, like, if you compare the hospital to a, to a human body, um, where for example, let's say the consultants are the brains and the nurses are like the lungs, the porters mm. and the cleaners are the are basically the blood and the and the and the kidneys because you you know kidneys clean our bodies and like cleaners are also cleaning our hospitals and without cleaners hospitals cannot operate so my the other message that i'm trying to push forward is that we should actually value people pay them yeah. more respect yeah. them more because these are the people who are they are from the working class and they are 99% migrants all my fellow cleaners are literally like from uh, migrants from Africa uh, who yeah. settled here 20 years ago and also from yeah. the Windrush generation. So yeah. that's the exact um, um, when when um, I'm I'm because I'm also a nurse and when I ever work in, in or when I was working and occasionally when I work now in London, the, the, the cleaning staff, it's like they're ghosts and people ignore them. And I, I just love chatting to people who can tell. And um, so I also shocked that I'm like hi how are you they're like huh like someone's so, and, and that just breaks my heart like that's such basic human behavior to acknowledge someone's existence and to say hi or to smile yeah. you don't have to have a long conversation yeah. I mean you you know what it's like in the hospital no one often has time for long conversations but just to be like hi oh yeah rather than do this or can you do this it's like oh good to see you how are you let's do this blah blah it's a completely different yeah I, I and you actually get to experience it, depending on what you're wearing, within like ten minutes yeah, of each other. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, and and another. Um, you were talking about being a, a, a teacher in Damascus. Oh, I actually, sorry, my my earpiece, my little earpiece, Sophie, mm -hmm. is telling me. Um, just to, for those that are new to um, joining us, we are speaking with Hassan who's um, from Damascus, living in London. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, please, if you've got questions, do ask them, and um, uh, we will do our best to answer them. My little earpiece, or I don't really have an earpiece, it's just someone yeah. sat. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were talking earlier about being a teacher in Damascus. Um, I'm really curious, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people ask you, what are the key differences between living in Damascus, obviously I'm talking pre-war times and like living and working there versus living and working in London. Is there any big shocks that you thought, oh, every I thought everyone would have a very posh accent and that's what, or, oh, I thought everyone would drink tea. <laughs> you know, like, is there anything that like shocked you about living in the UK? Um, I, it's not as good as I expected it to be, to be honest, because there's this, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, especially post Brexit, I was like, I should have gone to Spain because at least like it's, it's similar uh, culturally and, um, 
culturally, because it's Mediterranean, it's not and Syria is Mediterranean as well. But uh, the biggest shocks that I had is that I felt like um, I felt like London is the only city, and the rest is like basically countryside. Um, because um, because London is given a lot of attention, while there are so many places around the UK which which don't receive any funds and don't receive any so uh, impoverished areas. Because I because of the type of my work, I've literally been all over around the UK, and I've been places where are like people are so, like deprived of everything, and I I've seen things like the fact that the fact that three million people are on food banks. That's something that I didn't, I, I couldn't even imagine that like the country, country with the fifth strongest eco economy in the world would have uh, um, people on like relying on food banks. So that was, that was, that was one of the shock things. And culturally speaking, it's, it's, um, uh, I, I just, again, like I, it was, it was, it wasn't as good as I expected because, because in terms of my, like, when we were doing the journey, always the UK was like on like it was like the dream, you know. Like if you go to the UK, you'll be sorted, but um, mm -hmm. but that's not right because <laughs> my friends who are in Germany are actually now um, like doing better than some of my friends here in the UK. So it doesn't it, it's not about the country; it's about what you do and what you can offer. And I would have to say, like the food in terms of food, like. British food is a bit disappointing, like beans no, on toast. No. Beans on, <laughs> beans on toast. Like who the hell eats beans on toast and marmite? Like, <laughs> like we made hummus and you guys made marmite. Like what the? <laughs> Look, this, is, this is really helpful. What, what's your beans on toast? I mean, it's quite basic to be honest. Because I, I mean, I, if I, if I list if I list the things that my mom can make, my you would be you would be amazed. Like it's a our food is an extravaganza of, of, of flavors and spices and stuff. And here you guys like do what, what is it like pie? And I'm yeah. not trying, I'm not trying, I'm not trying. I'm just, I'm being, right. a, bit, I'm, I'm being a bit sarcastic. Right. But, uh, <laughs> I know you're right because I obviously um, had a lot of um, uh, food cooked for me when I'm in Greece, but by people in the camps and oh my God, I, it's every time I'm just blown away. And how can you cook on one stove an absolute piece? <laughs> Love anything. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I secretly agree with you, but I've just got to stay patriotic. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, yeah. yeah, that's it, really. And 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 you've been back to um, the camps. Was it just with Exodus that you were going back and visiting? You've been back to Moria, and you you were in Moria, right? I was in Moria. Um, I went to Samos. I went to. Um, 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 in northern Greece uh, at uh, Thessaloniki, I went uh, to Alexandria. Um, yeah, and things I've I've noticed how things have changed because in 2015. How? Yeah. Sorry, in 2015 and 2016, basically, uh, Europe was like an airport terminal. You like there are people like literally like on the move all the time. There, there's nothing stopping you. You could literally make it from Greece to Norway in nine or ten days and buses, trains. It was like people are being fast tracked. But um, obviously that has changed now because I went back. I went back there. I saw the difference. I thought the difference is that um, there was this state like it was so static. Basically, it, 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 um, it's uh, people are stuck. I've met people yeah. who in camps who've been there for two years and three some some people in three years of, in on in Moria camp and, and some of the islands, um, and obviously that's uh, if you if imagine like the the, the emo like the physical and the emotional toll that and the mental toll that can play on pe people it's 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 unimaginable. Um, I've noticed also the shift in in mood in terms of like host communities because while there are still a lot of uh, st still a lot of people lo locals welcoming and helping. But also there are, I, I, I basically um, uh, encountered the Golden Dawn, the, the far right uh, group in, 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 in Lesbos. And I, I also went to, to, to Eastern Germany, um, where I also noticed like thousands of people protesting, saying like migrants and refugees are not welcome here. So it's... Um... Have, you ever, have you ever met someone that, that has been protesting and been able to speak to them and get through to anyone? Or is it just that, that you can't, at that stage, you can't get through to someone? I can get through to anyone. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> that's, that's something that uh, Farah, my fiance and I, we always disagree on because she, 
um, I am happy to speak to anyone. Um, uh, she does not, she's not very keen on it, but let me give you the story because I believe that if you can talk, if you can have a chat with someone and present them with facts, they can change their minds. Because I once did a talk in London two years ago. And after the talk, I was approached by a guy who said, who literally, that's exactly what he said. He said, I, I heard about you and I came to this talk to listen to you. And having listened to you, I want to tell you that I am actually an active EDL member, but I am like, you've changed the way I think about things. And I am considering going to a refugee camp to volunteer. So, that yes, so, that's, so a story like this always inspires me to, to, mm -hmm. to like, to speak to people, to have a chat, to, because you, you never know, because you know, I believe in dialogue, basically. I believe in conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, uh, it's so true. Sometimes it, that, there are some times where I think pick your battles, just not, not this time. Um, but then there are some times where you can really have a conversation and really get through to someone, and it's just down to ignorance. It's yeah. not because they are, I, I find it with, generally speaking, older generations are kind of so set that it's hard for, you can have conversations absolutely with some of them, but some of them you can't, and you kind of can get a sense a little bit. Um, but then, yeah, you can absolutely get through to some people because they have only read certain things and they didn't know um, yeah other experiences or facts or anything and and you can actually go somewhere with them um that must be really strange for you though going to the camps and seeing people that are are stuck like does that do you how does it have an emotional toll on you or are you okay like you're mentally prepared for it i mean honestly i mean <laughs> i go and my last story is how i feel about it because uh because yeah. <laughs> because uh, um i I go to, to help. I go to, 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 to help tell a story or in, in photograph or in video or uh, to, to raise money. Because um, I, like, I, I work with um, Help Refugees on the fundraising advocacy side. So I would like, I always like to see things so I know what I'm talking about. And it doesn't, I mean, it's, 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 it's I feel like the refugee crisis will never be solved ever like there will always mm -hmm. be refugees the population of refugees will always and will always increase given global warming given like pandemics given all of this nonsense and like man-made um wars and crisis mm -hmm. so i feel like what you guys do i mean and 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 what i do and what thousands of other people do is very important now is very important because grassroots and individuals fill a lot of gaps there are a lot yeah. of gaps in systems and like in, 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 in any in any form of uh, um, community uh, or government and we have to fill and I yeah. I mean I I'm happy to I'm happy to risk it so yeah, yeah. And, and you mentioned about choose love or help refugees same charity um, how how did you first meet them and, and why did you choose them to do so much work with I chose Choose Love because Choose Love basically is the way they started. Is it's uh, um, um, this, this, the beginning of Choose Love was was an incredible story because they started basically when I was still in Cali, and uh, I had met one of some of their volunteers when I was still in the jungle, and um, I, <laughs> I mean, I I have a lot of respect to every NGO, every charity. I think they're all doing doing amazing work, but I love my approach to Choose Love is that there's a there isn't a lot of bureaucracy <laughs> and like so many people to have to, to like go through until you want to get something done. Like literally I would WhatsApp Josie about an idea or something or a pitch and she'd be like, yeah, let's do it. And the next day it will be done. And I feel like with grassroots and what, I mean, it's similar to you guys, it's just, it's a lot easier to get shit done. Yeah. And I, yeah. <laughs> and the fact that they've also like, you know, like Choose Love is also like funding projects in Syria, and I care about every country. I mean, I care about that, but like the fact that they fund, like, help fund projects that help Syrians and stuck in the Syria region and help people from all over, from every, every corner of the world. But I, I suggest things to them. I pitch it to them. They always, they always have like they always listen, like they listen and they think, take things on board sometimes. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's just so much less red tape around the grassroots and, and also like, uh, again, it's a great opportunity to thank you for, 
for doing this interview because I know that you had so many and then you kind of needed to, to focus a bit more on your work because it was a bit too much, I suppose, doing the cleaning <laughs> of the day. And, and yet you said yes to our interview because we're grassroots and I honestly really cannot thank you enough. It's exactly from support from people like you, how we keep going. No, it's the least I can do. I, 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 I support you like with every like with, <laughs> I always support you, and I will. I'm happy to work with you on or, or like I don't know help at any point because volunteers are genuinely saving lives. Like volunteers, people who are um, handing out um, uh, food um, uh, parcels or um, uh, hygiene kits or uh, translating or doing any simple job in anywhere around the world. They're genuinely saving lives. So I, I would yeah. like to I would like to be involved in that and thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah, and and just like I know you you've got uh, your evening ahead and and this is um, <laughs> over half an hour and it's been so lovely talking to you. Just before you go, last question: um, What would you say to someone that wants to to volunteer and uh, or they're considering even a career in the grassroots sector? Like, what should been your experience of it and like what would you say to them? I will say it's one of the best careers in the world, and I think you should just weigh, weigh your options. Because I, well, a lot of people are always inspired and motivated, and they want to go to help. But sometimes they're not in the right, um, like they're not m mentally or physically ready to go. So they, sometimes they go and like they can't get really help, or they can't get things done the way they envisioned that they will. So I would appreciate it if people um, um, are prepared. Uh, they've done their research, they know which uh, uh, grassroots or NGO or charity they want to volunteer for. And uh, well, they, I mean, they go out and do it. And like, you don't have to commit to a long period. You can, gen like, because I've met volunteers who just go out for a week or two and you can get so much work done um, yeah. it, during that short period of time. And um, it's, it's, I think it's one of the most noble careers in the world to, 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 to do this. And uh, yeah. Something I about serving other, serving other people is I, I just yeah it's just the best the the best thing like bringing that community that's that's how I always see it that we kind of have lost along the way the community vibes in a lot of places certainly where I've grown up and and I just feel like well I'm hoping it's touching word I'm meant to be going back to Greece tomorrow um, oh good we'll luck <laughs> thank you so much thank you good luck. Let's see, but um, if I'm I'm so excited to join the community. Like that's my feeling. Like I'm going back to the community. And that's so yeah. sad. We definitely don't have that. Other than my family here, I don't have that community feeling here at all. Back in the UK, so yeah, it, there's something so special about it, and um, and just everyone's looking out for each other, and yeah, and it's it's just the best thing. But thank you so much. Honestly, this has been such a pleasure, and I don't use this word lightly. You are such an inspiration. I know you'll hate you. hearing it. You really <laughs> thank are. You. And Thanks. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure thank speaking you. to you. Thank you. Best of luck in Greece. Thank you. I'll see you when thank I'm back. You. Hopefully. Yeah. Normal. Hopefully. <laughs> Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.